Um, so just to provide a little bit of background then to today's roundtable, um, last year in the UK, uh, the government released a national data strategy and this sets uh, out some, some guidelines and ambitions aiming to unlock the power of data for the UK. Uh, now, better use of data, we generally agree, supports better design and delivery of public sector services. And in and during the pandemic, we saw quite an accelerated digital transformation at local and regional government level. Um, for instance, uh, we saw how data and digital um, helped to, to mobilize communities, um, to have digital communications, digital service delivery, and um, basically life continued pretty much as normal, but remotely. Um, but as we also know, the other side of the coin is that local authorities, local regional government deal with tremendous budget pressures and budget cuts are always, always there. Um, there's just not an infinite amount of money, unfortunately. Um, and I think the good thing is that data does have the potential to, to help there to reduce costs, to enable more targeted, better service delivery, um, to, to combat fraud and just drive efficiencies in general. And now um, today we're going to speak with this excellent panel and I'll ask them to introduce themselves uh, in a wee bit about some of these challenges and opportunities for local and regional government to get the best value and the most benefit from better data sharing. Um, now, one, one quick word. Unfortunately, uh, Faith from Microsoft was unable to um, to join today. Unfortunately, she's off sick, but we have some amazing panelists. Um, so without further ado, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself, uh, Margaret Moore, Max Moore. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Mags Moore. I work for Soprasteria. I've been um, here for 11 years next month. And my role is um, I have a portfolio that I look after, which is Scotland, local government for the UK, as well as digital identity and working with our joint ventures. And I'm um, pretty passionate about working with SMEs. And we, I've known the, the Sticker crowd for quite a while. So it's really my pleasure to, to be joining the panel today. Thanks for inviting me. And we also have Carol Peters, who's cybersecurity architect at Renfrewshire Council. Hi, yeah. Um, as I said, Madeline, uh, Carol Peters, I work at uh, Renfrewshire Council. I've been working in the local authority sector now for um, longer than I probably care to admit, but it's certainly um, in excess of 20 years. And I've uh, been doing the role in, in um, private sector before that as well. So. Um, yeah, we've uh, data sharing is something that's been an increasing challenge over the years. So um, we've, we've become uh, well versed at it. Thank you, Carol. Um, and then we've got Peter Ferry, who's CEO of SICAR and Honorary Consul of Estonia. Thanks, Maddy. You, you're doing all the introductions. I don't need to say what I do now. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, as Maddy said, um, I'm one of the founders and CEO of, of SICAR. We are a data sharing platform who've been working particularly in Scottish government over the past few years addressing some of these data sharing technologies, uh, data sharing problems and issues with, with some new technologies. So uh, yeah, excited to be here and to, to join the debate. Thank you, Maddie. And finally, we've got Robert Club, who's in, nowadays an independent consultant and previously Chief Security Officer at the Improvement Service. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Robert Club. I, I was up until about three or four weeks ago, I was Chief Security Officer at the Improvement Service. Um, I worked in local authorities from really from the beginning of my career, moved to the Improvement Service in 2006. And since then, I've been mostly involved in digital identity. I sit on the Scottish Government's um, Identity Expert Group. Um, and uh, Privacy and making sure that people are at the centre of their transactions with government is a, is a big thing for me. Thank you, Robert. Um, and I suppose we just kick off with like the elephant in the room, if you like. Um, and I'm virtually looking at Mags. Uh, what do you... The elephant in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Not literally. <laughs> just to clarify. Um, <laughs> Mags, um, obviously you're not the elephant in the room. 
but the issue that's the elephant in the room is, and Carol alluded to it, um, what do you currently see as the biggest, most immediate challenge uh, and data sharing challenge for local authorities? Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge is, is, is often policy, actually, what, and, and the, the, um, the employees within the council and them knowing what the policy is and is the policy actually allowing them and empowering them to, to share? Because often when you have the right policies and everybody knows about them, then you can actually, people are confident to do that. So it's for me, it's a bit about policy and then also the trust just you know that the employees because we're talking about people at the front line that are often dealing with vulnerable people you know in, in social services and education you know they need to know that they can trust the data that they're, they're they're using and the citizens need to know that they can also trust that 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 data is not going to be used elsewhere so for me that's the so I've, I've cheated and done too so there's there's policy and trust from my perspective policy and trust is that something you recognize peter would you agree with that Totally. I think um, the, uh, the the trust issue is really fundamental to how uh, how, how data can be shared across, across right across the public sector. And really, there's um, in my mind, it's kind of uh, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of situation because there's huge um, pressure to make sure that our data is secure and that we observe some of those uh, privacy things which Robert started to allude to in his introduction. Um, we've all seen examples of uh, th things that have um, gone wrong, even in, in recent times with the Christmas Eve ransomware attack on, on, on SEPA, the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, uh, last year. But uh, also, you're, you know, there's pressure to share that data. So the, 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 the consequences of not sharing are possibly more grave because we've seen um, some of those situations like in the uh, fishmongers incident in London, which came to trial last week in the um, Grenville Tower uh, aftermath, where um, the consequences of not having transparency and sharing of data are, can be incredibly severe, you know, e uh, e even into the um, vestiges of, of fatalities in, in, um, in both of those si situations. So local authorities really need to they really need to respect both, and they're pretty pivotal to this because um, I guess that they're at the centre of, uh, of of civic society. And I think um, you know, in terms of the biggest challenges, which was was your question, long answer I know, but if I come back to the question, the you know, a really good example, particularly in the UK, is around um, health and social care integration. You know, there's a that is a um, a problem which we're still addressing. We've learned about the importance of the local response in the past year in the, the, in the COVID um, aftermath. So really it's about empowering the community and have the right policies for that, but doing that with reliable data, which really comes back to that, 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 that point of, of trust. And you know, today there's, there's not really an infrastructure for that. And that's something which I think really needs to be addressed at the, at the local authority level. Thank you. Um, and, and Carol, obviously, working for, for a council in a data role, um, could you describe one of your main challenges and what, what solution or technical solution, I suppose, uh, you have applied to that? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're really, really good at doing the, the big data sharing. So um, you will get sharing protocols in place and, and everybody knows what they're doing. We we're not really quite so good and we're having quite a challenge with this, increasingly a challenge actually, because um, I don't think COVID has helped us any uh, with this, is in the small scale sharing. So the sole trader, um, the child minder, that, that kind of very small sort of micro organisation type sharing, where we've, we've really come to the realisation that we're not doing that very well. Um, and, and over the period of COVID, this has highlighted it really quite badly. So, you know, you can't ask um, a, a sole trader um, or a foster carer even for that matter to go and get themselves accredited to Cyber Essentials. They don't understand it, you know, and I know it's meant to be simple, but it's not really. Uh, so we need to come up with something that is much, much simpler, something that's a, almost at a home security level uh, of, of, you know, like just 
simple things like please use internet security software on your your device that kind of thing um and and, and moving more to sort of encryption as well to try and and not, not anonymize but to try and and um take that sort of personal identifying aspect away from it um so we're we, i'm actually looking um i'm working with a, a group of scottish uh, local authorities just now to start to look at developing a policy or of so, or a guidance of some kind that we can use with that because it's a, a common common issue. Um, we have looked at different platforms, primarily Office 365, because we are um, mostly all sort of moving on to that platform. So we've been looking into using that and um, we have found a few issues. And it's a shame that Microsoft aren't here today because it would have been good to find out what um, what they had to say about it, but we what we have found is Microsoft platform SharePoint all works really well when you're using a Windows device. Our foster carers um, and our taxi drivers, our um, child minders tend to use Android devices and SharePoint falls down at that point. And that, that is a big challenge that we are now having. Um, so we have moved to egress for some things uh, just to make it uh, easier, especially for foster carers. But that's, you know, we don't want multiple solutions. We want simple, easy solutions that make it easy for our staff because I don't want to confuse staff either by saying, if it's this, you use that. If it's that, you use this. Um, because that's just complicated for them as well. I need to, I need simple solutions for my staff as well as for the um, the, the public uh, sole traders and, 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 and just the people who are, are helping, you know, deliver council services. Because a lot of these services, the council don't directly deliver them themselves you know we get other people to do it for us we we just the council just says these kind of services are needed but then we get other people to do it for us so it is quite a, a bit of a problem just now actually quite a challenge so um yeah, that's actually really interesting especially carol your, your point but if, quite a few interesting points you made like the you the solutions you have for your citizens and your service users needs to be simple and straightforward. Um, yet it needs to be secure. You spoke about encryption. Um, and you also mentioned this patchwork almost of solutions um, and that it needs to be brought in line. I'm paraphrasing that a little bit. Is that is that by right? It kind of is a little bit. It's because um, different, uh, different services and even different teams of people within the council have maybe um, tried to come up with their own solution. Not Every council necessarily has a recognised information security officer that they can go to for, for advice on the right technologies that they should be using, um, or staff don't feel confident that they can go and speak to that person. That is a bit of a problem sometimes. Um, so yes, it is a patchwork where you've got people who have said, well, I've been told email secure, so I'll use email. But they, they, you know, staff, in all fairness, staff are not going to think this through from beginning to end. So, you know, yeah, I've, I've sent a secure email to you. Well, what are you going to do with the information I sent you? Where's it going? What are you doing with it? Are you printing that off? Or are you downloading it onto to another device? You know, staff won't think that through. So, yes, it is a bit of a patchwork and we need to simplify it as, as much as we possibly can. Just a very simple flowchart that says it's data. So just deal with it this way and, and, and try not to try not to make that so complicated that somebody, you know, staff just sort of don't follow it because they don't understand it. Um, um, that's really interesting. Thank you, Carol. And I was just um, going to ask Robert, um, in your work for Improvement Service, and it probably can't hurt, we've got quite an international audience to just quickly explain what Improvement Service does or did, well, it still does, <laughs> but what you did at Improvement Service. Um, so you hear from Carol now about you know, some of these challenges that they have. So if a local authority would, would knock on your door tomorrow and say, you know, we're scrapping everything and we're just going forward in a, in a better direction, what, what would you say to them? From a standards point of view. From any point of view. Yeah. Point of view <laughs> data yeah. sharing point of view. From a data sharing point of view. Well, I mean, I, I would be looking at, you know, standards for me are the, are the key thing here because that's the, the pillar on which the trust is built for, for everybody when it comes to data sharing. Um, I look at the digital strategy, which the Scottish government just released recently, which is pretty good in some places. Um, I think there's a wee bit of detail underneath it, maybe that's missing. Um, but I, I think that 
you know, the mention of a data standards catalog in a community of practice is quite a good idea, but I think it need, maybe needs a wee bit of time for that to become established. But there are still, still some good things out there. The UK government launched its um, data quality framework guidance uh, some months ago, and it's definitely well worth looking at. So looking at, um, you know, very similar type of thing to exercise that uh, organisations went through with GDPR, which is looking at the data you've got, uh, looking at where it can be improved, doing a, a kind of inventory of things, looking at the, the high impact data, then drawing up some, some kind of improvement plan for it and, and associating some metrics around it. So I think so, that some things like that are quite good. I know that some of the work that, that we did in the improvement service in helping local authorities to to improve the quality of their back office data was quite good because uh, the poor quality in the, of, of data held in legacy systems is a real issue. You know, and particularly when it comes to things like digital public services, when you're maybe someone's presenting some information uh, and that can be quite, it can be quite good, uh, high quality verified information, but you're having to match that against information that's held in a number of different back office systems. So, I might be known as Robert or Bob or R. My 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 um, surname is often misspelled as club with one B, clubs with with a Vanessa, Chub. There's all sorts of things, and depending on how that's uh, that's held in a back office system, it can be quite difficult to match the the information that's coming in, whether it's from someone presenting it uh, online or even just uh, data coming in from some other mechanism. Trying to, to match those things together is very really difficult. So I think the um, the data quality uh, frame, framework is very really good. The other document I would point people to would, would be the uh, the IEX framework guidance that came out from DCMS, so Department of Culture, Media and Sport, came out in in March, looking at the good practice. It's basically a taking some of the good practice guides around di digital identity and extending them out to some other areas around uh, personal information attributes and looking at the processes for um, verifying those attributes in a particular way, whether it would be, you know, checking them against reference sources, guidance on how often you refresh that because all information, as I, I'm sure Carol would would uh, testify to uh, has a lifespan, so you need to. It needs to be managed on an ongoing basis. It's not just a, a question of taking it and storing it. So I would definitely look at those two things um, as a starting point, and hopefully the the work that comes out of the the government's the Scottish government's uh, digital strategy. I would hope that we would see some things established there, and that we would start to look at some of the good practice from Estonia, from Denmark, from other countries that do this a lot better than we do. Speaking then of Estonia and good practice, <laughs> there's an obvious person here that could potentially say a little bit more about that. And maybe also, um, Peter, how, how uh, your your platform uses some of those standards or practices. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, th thanks, Maddie. Yeah, that was really interesting, Robert. The um, I suppose that uh, th thinking some of the standards and particularly around um, uh, identity that you mentioned there this kind of uh, to, to 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 bring it back to data sharing the um in citizen uh citizen identity that's a that's something that's quite commonly understood there's been solutions around that for a couple of decades and it's not so much a um a, a technical challenge it's more a, an adoption challenge that i, I guess the, in the improvement service you, you you might have experienced in, in in rolling out some of these systems. I think the the really interesting bit, the the challenge technically, is around how we adopt standards for the for that collaboration on on trusted data. So it's kind of moving it to the next stage and how um, when you move out with the boundaries of a particular organisation, and, and and what Carol talked about in the patchwork of, of systems, how do you get that that collaboration to work based on uh, trustable data that all organizations can kind of rely on. Cause that's really the key to, um, you know, not just streamlining things from a citizen with a, a single sign on, but to, to actually deliver an improvement in, improved outcomes, I guess. Um, the, 
and you know you mentioned the DCMS and how uh, in the UK we're kind of getting around to lo looking at this. I suppose the you know the, the things happening there around um, UK government pointing towards orchestration of organisations in the Dig digital attribute trust framework, um, and in Scottish government the work you've been a part of, part of uh, Robert in 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 the digital identity projects around you know the an ecosystem there for that kind of attribute sharing but um you know i'd, I'd, I'd argue that uh this is a class of problems around multiple organizations and how they work together that only the distributed technologies the shared trust technologies can can solve effectively um and you know that that you know that 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 problem that that we need to start moving on to by adopting the appropriate standards that are now emerging is how organizations in with their different IT investments, whether they're large organizations or sole traders and one-man bands, how can they trust each other, share reliable data, and still protect um, individual or organizational consent? You know, if you can, that's the that's the problem to crack. And I think the early adoption of some of the emerging global standards around that is really the, the key to local governments being able to uh, local government being able to adopt it quickly. I you know, don't disagree with anything you say there at all. I mean, I think that, that there are good examples of that. We, we sometimes, we're our own worst enemy with these things, you know, and there's a, I, I know that people often look to Estonia as being a, a good exa example of where we should look. But if you look at the, the components that sit within some of the things they do, you know, they've got the X road stuff, which is great. They've got a national population register, and that's when things start to fall apart a little bit. Because yeah. The, yeah. the minute you start talking about national data sets or national identity stuff, that's where it starts to get difficult. Um, and I think that some of the work the Scottish government is doing at the moment around uh, digital identity it is, a, it is groundbreaking. It is about looking at putting people in control of their data and really their that to organisations with explicit consent. So I think that we'll see what happens with that. You know, obviously people remain sceptical, as you would expect, given that we've all been working on this for, you know, the best part of 20 years and have made, um, let's be honest, zero progress on it. That's a, a UK government and a Scottish government level. Uh, and, and I think that to, to crack that, you're absolutely right. We need to think, rethink it, look at putting people in control of their data and see how we build some of that out. I guess, I guess where I have some fears over that is when it relates to trying to start small and big build and build big doesn't really work for that type of thing. You kind of pretty much have to have everybody in uh, on day one to make that work. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. I think there's, there's certainly some interesting developments coming down the line. Uh, Max, in your work with uh, local and regional governments, and maybe this is more a question for Carol, but I'm going to try you, Max. <laughs> is, you know, how much of their day-to-day -day activity around data sharing or even their planning is based on government policy? Um, is there a gap between what's actually needed right now and what's in the works at a higher level? Probably, but I think what's really interesting is that why I think things will work now and they didn't work, Robert was saying we've been trying for sort of, you know, 20 years and even the last 10 years, is that both Scottish government with their Scottish um, service design standards and also uh, UK government with GDS, it is really the culture has now changed that it is that it's all about the user, that we should be designing services with users. And I think Robert alluded to the kind of trust framework you know, that DCMS have brought out and obviously we'll, we'll have something similar in Scotland. Do you know, I think now is the time where data sharing can really um, work. And I think if, I don't know where the gaps are in policy, but I do think if we take it service at a time and council and look about where the interactions are with the individuals, with also, let's not forget the staff, the council staff, you know, they need to have access and um, relevant access to, to people to help them and those people absolutely should be in control so in some cases the policy and the legislation is there in many cases and in other cases inevitably it won't be but I think we need to do it from a user uh, a user journey perspective that should be the starting point 
it, from a service, it, you know, and do it by, you could do it potentially service by service. And I think we'll then link up this framework that Robert's talking about is it, it can't just be one thing, it needs to be at all. But ultimately within a council, quite a lot of services are, are, are a bit simpler. You know, like I renew my car parking permit every year. That's completely different to when my little brother was made homeless and we were trying to, to talk to the council. We were trying to talk, and, and they were wonderful in Scottish borders, I have to say. You speak to the council, then they put you in touch uh, with the housing associations. Had there been that ID thing there and we could say, and, and as a somebody that can use technology and he can't, by the way, as a disabled person, where I could have just said, yes, I am happy to share this information, my brother's date of birth, um, the doctor's you know, reports and everything like that. If I'd just been able to share it all straight away and trusted, they trusted me that that was correct, and, and, you know, then I think that that's what we need to build our services around. Uh, and I think then if there's a gap in policy or a gap in legislation, as you know, there has been before about health and, uh, and social care, then we can solve it. But at the moment, I wonder whether we really know enough. I mean, I certainly don't, but I, I, I do wonder if we had those user journeys. And that's at the heart of, of Scottish government and of, of UK government. So that's where I think it should be. It's all about consent, permission and trust. Consent, permission and trust. Do you do you agree with that, Carol? Do you, would you um, I actually think it's a little bit more basic than that just now, um, and I'm thinking about the journey that uh, Remshire Council is going through at the minute. Um, information itself is not really seen as an asset. It's 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 just a set of data that people go and and use and collect and 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 you know that that's it. A lot of the time, uh, one of the things that we did, uh, the council has introduced, is a major program of work, which is about um, making information, actually making it an asset itself, and understanding what it is, collecting all that information because uh, local authorities, uh, you speak local authorities as they are a lent. It is not. It's a series of um, it's a series of services that work in isolation to each other a lot of the time. Um, Databases that that really do work in isolation of of um, of other databases. Um, that's why there's a repeat of information uh, across different uh, line of business applications. Uh, the data quality, as Robert said, sometimes can be shockingly bad. Um, and it was quite a big exercise that was done by the improvement services and trying to improve that. Um, but that was a one off thing. So we do still have a bit of a data quality issue there. And I think even the data sharing itself is, is also done in isolation. You know, me as a, a, you know, if I was a social worker, I'm sharing data with um, the, the, within the, the, the role that I am playing at that point in time. Um, and I don't necessarily know that uh, that um the people the people that I, sh I should speak to within housing but i think what what uh, max is saying certainly is right and i think that that's i've certainly seen signs of that change and you know we've, we've got the the tell us once approach at a national level and i am seeing local authorities starting to to try to to work with a, a tell us once type approach at the local level as well um some are doing it better than others uh, I have to say, and I don't know that everybody is definitely doing it. So there is, I, I guess, there is some recognition of all of that. But for me, it, it's, it really is just this basic of the information itself is your asset. And, you know, if you look at that and look at the value, that's that's how we deliver our services. So it would be really quite good to, you know, to treat it with the respect that it's, it's due. And we don't do that. The only time a local authority will look at all the information it has about you as a person is if it gets a subject access request. Fair enough. Um, um, then Peter, um, it seems like a pretty moment, well, just for me, it seems like a momentous task to, um, to accelerate this almost, to drive these benefits from better data quality, better data sharing, more uniformity, standards, um, I, I can imagine it would be well, yeah, slightly overwhelming, maybe. Uh, so, so where, how, how do they get started? How, how does a local authority um, derive these benefits? Where did they start? Yeah. So, um, it, uh, it was interesting to hear uh, Carol uh, just around uh, 
understanding you know what the true nature of a local authority is it's a it's a collection of different services and i think um in in, in our experience at sicker actually it's also around uh the uh, other organizations that the authority works with in in the um you know in social care and in the third sector to deliver overall local services um so you know you you, you asked the question there is how how do we how can we get started and i'll just sort of go back to a, a previous point that was made um because uh robert talked about you know in in, in estonia having their you know their system of assumed consent and having it being necessary i think you said robert in in scotland to have a a kind of a big bang approach without being able to make incremental changes that deliver value at a local level that that discourages me a little bit because I would like to think that, um, particularly around the d data sharing, that it is absolutely possible to look at the at the local level. I think local authorities are the are the key here because they understand locally who the organisations are. They're working with large and small organisations. Sometimes in the third sector, it's organisations who have relatively immature technology, perhaps, or or kind of. A more legacy free environment and so there's some i do think there are, are some low-hanging fruit areas there to op an opportunity to deliver improved outcomes by data sharing at that smaller and local level and to build 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 from there um you know just for for example i think um we we've been uh, working around some open standards, particularly around the emerging open referral standard for how the Ministry of Local Government and Communities is trying to enable charities to describe their services and a framework for them to accept uh, data sharing from um, local authority and health sources. Um, and there's other examples of some of those standards, like in the, um, the World Wide Web Consortium standard for verified credentials, where these are things which perhaps can be adopted more quickly to enable some of those data sharing and integration tasks to, to happen a little bit more quickly than at a national infrastructure level and you know deliver deliver things more cost effectively that, that deliver a better service at the at the local level okay move, moving on then and looking a little bit more into how we share citizen data um mags how what's your recommendation for ensuring that the way we share citizen data is done ethically uh, and securely i suppose what, what would you say to that oh so that's a big question so if ethics and securely i think on the on the ethics side i'm, I'm going to be a bit i'm going to i'm going to hark back to kind of sort of service design principles here about ethics i think whenever we're developing services we need to think about doing that ethically and we need to do that with specifically with inclusion in mind as well so i'm going to go back to my little brother here you know he couldn't get a hold of somebody on the phone so he didn't have a working um light in his bathroom for nearly a, a year and i just went and i did it online for him so we need to think ethically as we push things towards that digital towards digital channels ethically is that the right thing to do from an inclusion perspective so and i think that ethics is something which is going to become more and more important as we go through all the different aspects of it i think securely i mean carol's probably a better one to answer uh, that than myself from a security perspective i just think that wherever there's data you know there's going to be fraudsters there's going to be scammers there's going to be people trying to use that so it's about wrapping the the personal softer side of the service around whatever the data is that we're using just to constantly remind people we'll we'll never contact you this way you know we'll always do this and, and just trying to it's back to that sort of trust thing but i do think that I and mean, carol can maybe talk more about the protection side of security um, than i can and obviously peter within the sicar world you know the fact that we're distributing that data all over the place so even if somebody did break in they can't access everything about me I think that would give you a great comfort to know, well, they might find one thing out about me, one fact, but they can't find out all my facts. And I think that's where tech's starting to have a bigger role to play as, as organisations like SICKER have something which is 
easy to develop and easy to use so we can see how we manage to distribute the data around. So I, I think, um, but I, I would just on the ethics side, something I'm really passionate about is that it's got to be inclusive. And every time we talk about, every time we talk about um, digital, it worries me that it's not inclusive. Carol, um, your name was mentioned a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up on that. Um, I think, I mean, what Max is saying is, uh, is absolutely right. And we are moving forward um, these days to a, a data centric security approach, as opposed to talking about just um, uh, just information security, which is, is a lot wider, um, or IT security, which quite often can be um, can be quite uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word there, it, 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 it enclosed in its, its own particular area, just looking at IT rather than looking at the data itself. Um, so the the, the, the National Cyber Security Centre, um, the, the Public um, Service Network, the PSN, are both sort of um, moving towards that approach anyway, so they're encouraging those kind of approaches. Our um, local authority assessment, uh, annual assessment that we get under the, the PSN regime will, um, if, if I'm, what I hear is, is correct, will be moving towards looking at this sort of data centre approach so how we protect the data at rest and in transit and certainly the work that, that we're trying to do at our own local authority is taking that approach as well about just like okay what is the point of what, what is the point of, of um cyber security information security it security it's about protecting the data really at the end of the day um so we are looking at a lot of a lot of that how to simplify it again we're you know the the public sector generally has always been known as being, um, I can never say this word, but being a very giant behemoth um, in its own right. And they don't like to change, you know, that, that, and that in itself is changing, certainly. Um, but it, there is still, you know, there are still certain local authorities that you'll go to where your, um, your seniority defines what colour desk you get and where it's positioned. So, you know, it's, it is really, really quite difficult. Uh, it is very challenging that you're having to, you're having to fight through that side, that, that sort of whole side of things, the, the very traditional side of things and trying to drag it into the modern era as well, especially when, you know, let's be honest, it all comes down to money. And where is our priority? Is it in providing that service, that people service to the, the residents or is it, in trying to protect their data. And I would say that the, the data protection side of it now is kind of critical in its own right, because as Mag says, um, those, those cyber criminals that we've got out there, they like to get data in any way, shape or form that they can. And the more that they can get from a central source like a local authority, the more harm can happen to the individuals who that data is about. So realistically, we, you know, if we start looking at harm um, through cyber theft and, and cyber crime um, as part of just the person that, or the personal uh, service that we're giving to people, then hopefully it starts to bring context into a lot of these things. Because I can, I can do centrally, don't get me wrong, I can secure data, I, I can do a lot of things centrally. And that's exactly what we are doing. But sometimes at the end of the day, it really does come down to what um, what an individual is doing with the data that they've gotten a hold of. So it becomes everybody's responsibility. And that's a message that I'm, I'm keen to sort of start getting out. We don't just, um, our programme of, of cyber uh, security doesn't just deal with the council and council staff. We go out into the community and we talk to residents and we talk to vulnerable groups of people and, and, and charities who support vulnerable groups, trying to say to them, look, you know, what, what you do is important as well. People have to have some ownership of their own data at the same time and, 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 and take that ownership and understand what it is, of course, that they're taking ownership of and staff have to do that as well. So it's wider than just us as a local authority. Interesting, okay. And that's, um, we actually just had a question come in for Peter, Peter, I don't know if you've seen it, but how can local authorities ensure customer data security addressed on the microservice provider side? It's a, it's a long question. Um, from Hamam Sharif. 
So uh, I can't see the question, but on the microservice provider side, so data security at rest. Well, I think um, I suppose just to pick on a on a theme which Carol introduced there, um, the, the the nature of the challenges we have in securing data, particularly in the context of this discussion, you know, around um, around data sharing and what that enables for the citizen, um, the that the, the nature of that pro it's it's more complex there are more we, we'll have to extend our ideas of, of governance of data you know the policies for how we manage the data the tools that we use to protect it beyond maybe how we've worked over the past couple of decades in the it industry so so i think that um simplifying some of those technical controls around how you protect data has got to be part of the answer the um, the you know my co-founder and Sika comes from that kind of class and check cybersecurity environment, and the the layers of the onion model around how we build build protection around data have some potential to be simplified by, by some of these new um, distributed uh, controls, where we are not only kind of building in consent from a policy basis, we're actually building it in from a an enforcement basis. So that the chances of uh, um, accidental insider attacks and so on are um, are, 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 are reduced, and therefore uh, our data is 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 less less vulnerable. So basically, what what I'm saying is, you know, by by taking a, that the, some of these new cybersecurity approaches, we're potentially able to simplify the uh, simplify that complexity and better protect our data in a in a in a, in a data sharing world. Thank you, Peter and her mom. I hope that that answers your question. If you have a question later on for Peter, I'd be happy to send that through. Uh, we are nearly at time, unfortunately. So um, I would recommend everyone checks the chat window because there's been some good remarks from uh, Roberts, no, Simon, rather, sorry, Simon Roberts, um, with some additional information on what's being done in the data sharing space. Um, now, today's recording will be shared by email after the roundtable, and we also create a, a, a recap article that will be shared with everyone. Um, in the meantime, if you have a question or a follow-up discussion you'd like to have with any of the, uh, the panellists, um, please send me an email. You, you should have my email address um, from, from Eventbrite. Um, if not, you, uh, please find me. You can see my name, <laughs> it's a difficult name, but please find me on LinkedIn and I'd be happy to send uh, any messages through. Um, I wish to thank today's panellists, Max, Peter, Robert and Carol for each adding such an interesting viewpoint and really relevant information. So thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much, everyone.